Welcome, everyone. It's my great pleasure to talk about the historical perspective of the Cox Maze Three. I was there near the beginning, not the very beginning, and so I'll have a lot of insights, I hope, in how this all began and um, what it has meant for our field. Jim Cox is a true legend in cardiac surgery for many, many reasons. Um, he was at Duke when he developed the uh, Cox Maze procedure. I'm fortunate to have been the one that actually named it the Cox Maze procedure uh, at the Western Thoracic Surgery Association. Interestingly, the first Cox Maze procedure was done in 1987, 19 months after Jim's mom died of a stroke that was related to atrial fibrillation. This is one of a series of four patients that were just landmark in 1991. They published them in two separate issues of the journal. And uh, this is the one that showed how to do the operation itself, uh, following the basic science and the description of the, the problem of atrial fibrillation. Um, as you can see, it was a little hard to follow. Most of us in cardiac surgery aren't used to looking at the heart from backwards but it followed along with what the EP were, were talking about. Um, when Jim was doing that, I had just started at the Cleveland Clinic and Fred Loop was the chief of cardiac surgery when I was there before he became the CEO. And he would send me down to Wash U where Jim had gone by that time in early 1990. And I would stand uh, behind Jim and I would watch him do the surgery with my dictaphone and I would sit there dictating every step of the operation until I had understood it. Um, when we did the first operation at the Cleveland Clinic, um, Jim came and uh, actually did most of the surgery. I assisted him and uh, then I became the second surgeon in the world to do a Cox Maze procedure. This is from uh, the Western Thoracic Surgery Association paper that I mentioned published in 1993. At that time, we had only done uh, 14 patients beginning in January of 1991, mean age of 48. Um, only uh, two of those patients had concomitant mitral surgery. The very earliest days were really just lone AFib surgery. As you can see, I started to change the way we think about it in terms of getting drawings made that were from the surgeon's perspective. So we changed the way the surgeons might be able to approach this so that they could understand a little bit better, uh, in particular, some of the anatomy. Also noted um, that these are all suture lines. There was a small amount of cryoablation that was done at the mitral valve annulus at that time, but virtually everything was cut and sew. Uh, there were no radio frequency clamps at that time. These were really sick patients, however, at that time. Toby Cosgrove and I were the first to do uh, both a combined uh, maze procedure and a mitral valve repair. Uh, Toby would do the mitral valve repair and I would do the maze procedure. Um, when we set up the maze procedure with that septal incision as well as part of the Cox Maze 3, the exposure to the mitral valve was really outstanding. And so it really made it uh, kind of an easier mitral valve repair from that standpoint. Um, as time went on, Jim uh, left WashU and went to Georgetown and we were making some changes to the procedure when I was in Cleveland. Uh, this is showing what we changed to in about the mid-1990s. Uh, instead of a separate incision to the left atrial appendage, we just removed the left atrial appendage with the left atriotomy across the dome. That made it easier in terms of there were no T-shaped incisions. Uh, there was just a difference in size between the two. And also you could excise some of the excess tissue uh, of the left atrium as you put it back together. Uh, the clamp that is down at about the five o'clock position was really important because that really helped kind of hold the uh, two together and rotate the heart. And you can see at that time, uh, this was 2002 when we were doing these drawings, it was almost always with a mitral valve repair. Um, 
in uh, 2000 in the seminars in thoracic and CV surgery, Jim asked a few of us to get together from different institutions and report our experience. Uh, Hartzell Schaff and the Mayo Clinic also had a large experience by that time. Um, during that time, we had uh, done 100 patients with a maze operation. Um, most of them were men with a mean age of 58, kind of typical for a degenerative mitral regurg population. Um, I had done the maze one operation, the maze two operation seemed as if it came and went in about three or four months. Uh, and then we went on to the maze three procedure. And most often by that time, we were doing it at the same time as a mitral valve operation. The important part on this slide, which I hadn't looked at in many years, was it didn't take that long. Uh, you can see the cross clamp time for a maze procedure only was 56 minutes. Um, part of the combined maze and mitral valve was to do the opening to do the maze. Then you do the mitral valve and then you close. And so the only part that was different was adding the uh, mitral valve repair in the middle of it. And so by that point, we were down to uh, 72 minutes of cross clamp time to do a mitral valve repair and a maze procedure. Um, the bypass time, in particular the maze procedure only, some of those patients had what we were calling at the time tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy. Now we know better and we suspect that those are truly cardiomyopathy patients, probably of a genetic origin. And the bypass time was not all that different from patients that had a maze procedure with a mitral valve repair. Remember the additional bypass time was because at, at this time many of them were still cut and sew on the right side and there was quite a bit of sewing on the right side as well. Patients did a lot better though. Uh, this is showing that they were very symptomatic before. Syncope was present in about a quarter and then afterwards none. Thromboembolism in 14% and then afterwards zero. And stroke was zero in that series of 100 patients. So with the left atrial appendage excised, uh, we were actually uh, making a big difference in that group of patients. At about 2003 or four, bipolar radio frequency was being developed and, and was gaining clinical traction. We were hoping that it was going to be much faster and simpler than um, the maze three operation. But as you can see here with the clamps going around the right pulmonary veins and uh, the left pulmonary veins, it was different. This is not the same anatomy that most surgeons deal with took a little while to kind of get the hang of it. And the clamps in particular at that time were more awkward. Um, it was not necessarily a lot faster. We did change after a bit. And this is important because what we're focusing on now is we're recreating the box lesion. So there was one uh, lesion that was across the dome. And then there was a second lesion that was inferior. You're gonna see that kind of a shape before. And so, or again, and therefore we were creating a box lesion around all four pulmonary veins with just two applications of the clamp. And uh, it turns out that's gonna be one of the most fundamental things that we should do. Um, we've kind of evolved since that time. For many years, uh, we uh, were working with things like the radio frequency ablation, and now we're focused on cryoablation. And in the bottom right, you'll see a cell that got to minus 20 degrees centigrade, and it just explodes. And so when you get the cells to a cold temperature, minus 20 to minus 30 degrees centigrade, they absolutely rupture. There's no question about that. This is a paper that is impressed by Jim uh, and the rest of us looking at the physiology of cryosurgery. Um, and how to uh, create optimal cryo lesions. This is the operation that we've evolved to now, and we're re really going back in many ways to the Cox Maze 3. Um, on the left, you'll see a slit where the left atrial appendage is. That has been clipped already. We know uh, from the literature that the atrial clip can make uh, the left atrial appendage electrically silent. And then you'll see again, it's that box lesion that we're creating. The first application of the probe for three minutes is across the dome. It usually stops around P2. 
the second application of the cryoprobe for three minutes creates the total box lesion. And also just by bending the probe, you get the mitral valve isthmus lesion. So that goes across the uh, annulus and onto the base of the leaflet. And then the third is a two minute lesion. And we just put that directly on the cornea sinus under direct visualization. Uh, it's pretty simple to look underneath the uh, IVC and, and to see the cornea sinus in the same location. On the right side, there's also three lesions. Many times we're doing this at the same time as a tricuspid uh, valve annuloplasty. It's important to keep in mind the atrial pacemaker complex where the sinus node lives uh, up near the uh, lateral junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. And so one application is shown is from the right atriotomy to the tricuspid annulus. We typically put it also into the cornea sinus. One good lesion that runs right across the tricuspid annulus, Jim and I have talked about, is going to be just as effective as two separate lesions to the tricuspid annulus that was the original cut and sew, Cox Maze 3. And then lesions up the superior vena cava and down the inferior vena cava. And those are then performed on a beating heart as the heart's recovering from cardioplegia. You just have to keep blood out of the field with a pump sucker or a basket. And uh, those are only two minutes and typically you can get a, a transmural lesion. So where are we now? And it's 2021 now. So it's been 30 plus years of doing the maze procedure. Um, it's now a class one guideline with the STS, which is good. Um, the Cox Maze 4 is not really faster as we had kind of hoped that it was going to be. Um, it is using the clamps themselves, which uh, has some advantage over the original cut and sew in particular. Uh, but the data doesn't appear as if it is like remarkably faster. Probably most important is in the past several years, we're seeing multi center and other uh, propensity match trials that are looking at. Uh, adding AF ablation and the impact on survival. In each one of the curves below the red line are patients that had AFib before surgery and it wasn't treated. And then the lines above are showing patients that were treated with a maze procedure. And the one on the left from Northwestern shows patients as well who had never had a history of atrial fib. And so adding the maze restored survival to the same as those patients. So. Uh, there's more and more studies coming out that are indicating that uh, it is safe early on and that it may increase our late survival. So after these 30 years, what have we learned? Uh, it works. Patients are much more likely to be in sinus rhythm after they have a maze procedure than they are if it's untreated. Uh, there have been, I lost count, I think it's nine randomized clinical trials that show that. All the randomized trials also show it's safe. There was no difference in perioperative outcomes in the randomized trials. And then these longer term follow-up studies also show that it improves survival. But we need to increase adoption. It appears from various databases like Medicare and the STS that with mitral surgery, it's probably about 60% in Medicare patients is probably quite a bit lower, about 40% of patients are treated. Um, and that is with a class one guideline, same as the left IMA to the LAD, which is 99%. So we should increase the adoption. We need some re-education about that. Um, we really strive to create an efficient lesion set uh, we're using cryoablation because we think it's faster and it's easier and it's easier to teach. Um, but we have to maintain the basic principles and effectiveness. Box lesion, left atrial appendage, mitral annular line, and right-sided lesions uh, for many of the patients. We like to minimize the increase in cross clamp and bypass time. If you go on uh, the heart lung machine and you're on for a long time, you're gonna have more renal dysfunction. There are studies showing that cardiopulmonary bypass time is associated with mortality. So be efficient about this. There have been reports of high pacemaker use with the maze procedure. We just don't see it. 
Um, when we do just a mitral valve with a maze procedure, we run less than 1% of patients need a pacemaker at uh, Northwestern. When we look at all comers, reoperations, double valves, tricuspid valves, it's 4% need a pacemaker. And we think that you should set a goal within your institution, depending upon your patient population and what you know. Um, and so if you're experienced, we say 90% uh, compliance with that class one guideline for a mitral valve. Here at Northwestern, we run about 99% compliance with that. That's an important uh, number that you wanna know too when you read the literature because if people are highly selective about who they treat, that's gonna have an impact on their results. For coronary bypass and aortic valve, I will go ahead and I'll open the left atrium. It's not that hard to open and close the left atrium. And so I'll do the same lesions uh, for a coronary and then aortic valve. Others do pulmonary vein isolation and all. I think that currently a goal of about 60% for cabbage and AVR is acceptable. And in particular, if you're doing re-operations with patent bypass grafts, that can really be difficult. I'm happy to say that uh, my old mentor and friend, Jim Cox, joined us at Northwestern in 2016. He was visiting professor that year and he had a great time and we had a great time. So I said, why don't I give you a job? And he is now the director of cardiac surgery research. It is hard to understand are hard to state just what an impact Jim Cox has had on our field. It's shortly after Christmas now. And so the perspective that I thought I would use would be, it's a wonderful life. In that movie, it's kind of hokey, but it's fun. George Bailey is shown what life would have been like if he didn't exist. So one can imagine what might have happened if we didn't have Jim Cox developing the maze procedure like Shumway to heart transplant, like Carpentier to mitral valve and tricuspid valve repair, Jim really created this field that impacted not just surgeons, but also electrophysiologists, and fortunately, hundreds of thousands of patients. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.